Hi, good afternoon. Um, I think we're going to get started on this session. And um, so welcome to this session. Welcome, for, uh, welcome to this information session about the non jupus application process to the University of Hong Kong. Um, just doing a quick sound check since we are having this session on the webinar platform. Um, if you can hear me right now, um, can you actually, uh, you should be able to see a little hand button um, on your screen. If you can actually hear me, can you actually raise your hand so I know whether the audio is coming through all right to you? Okay. Okay. So it seems like we have a good number of you not having any issues hearing us. Okay, great. So it seems like we have a majority of you that does not have any issues with your with your with the audio. Um, so what we will do today is we would like to give you a chance um, to sort of hear about how this in non jupis international application process will work. Uh, I know some of you have been quite excited and started typing questions to us already. Uh, we will not um, be doing the questions on the chat panels today. Uh, instead, we will be reading those questions after I've gone through some of the basic information for you uh, and try to address the questions as a group, as I would imagine many of you have the same questions um, as your neighbors, um, even though you cannot see them. So well, I, I would ask if you could actually hold your questions for now um, to facilitate that. Um, and we will go through a very brief overview of what you can come to expect of the university's application process. And then we will go on to actually addressing questions and we will actually be reading the questions out um, to address them one by one. And so when we get, so we'll get started officially. Um, again, once again, a warm welcome to you all for joining us at this session. A good afternoon uh, here from Hong Kong. My name is Vicky Chen. I uh, work with the admissions and uh, admissions and academic liaison section of the registry, and I work specifically with students who are applying to the university with an international or in um, sort of other regional qualifications. Everyone under the scheme actually will be grouped under what we call a non jupis application. Um, so this is what you will see. For students who are applying to us, um, it doesn't matter if you're a local or non-local student, as long as you're holding an inter what we qualify as an international qualification, your application should be submitted under the international slash non jupis application scheme. And so under this scheme, we look at students of a wide range of quali qualifications. And there are different ways that we work with students to ensure that we understand your qualifications uh, well enough for, you, for us to assess whether or not you are a good fit to our university. One of the things that we always get asked is how do we evaluate students, especially when students come to us from a variety of qualifications. Um, what you will find is, is actually posted on our website is we have information on what we call expected lower boundaries. And they will usually be in the form of three of the most popular international qualifications for you to benchmark yourself at. Our programs admit non jupis international students at a competitive range. And so these ranges depends on what you're studying and depends on the subject that you'd like to apply to. It might be slightly different. And so you would want to keep an eye out for this information. And this is actually quite clearly posted on our website. Uh, if you go onto our website, you will actually see um, a downloadable file here that gives you um, specifically in the three main qualifications that we see from international applicants, what sort of score ranges we would consider to be at a lower boundary. How you should use this information is to guide your application. Um, this is not an absolute score. So there is no um, saying that if you have achieved a 31 in IB diploma, you will be guaranteed admissions in the Bachelor of Arts. That is not what this book is saying. What it is telling you is based on data we've been looking at since 2016, 2017, we see that many of the applicants who are successful usually are scored have scores of 31 or above in the IB diploma. And you then can expect to see students who comes in a range of 31 um, all the way to 44, 45 being admitted to the program. So this is how you can use to uh, 
sort of determine for yourself whether or not uh, you are you are academically you have the right credential and you have the right um, sort of um, background fitted for the program you're looking to submit an application to. Um, use that as a guide on the application because you can actually help yourself determine whether or not a program is within reasonable reach. There are two uh, other requirements that you also have to look at. So beyond the competitive range that is looked at overall in general for all students, there are actually specific requirements you also have to meet. The first of them being a program specific requirement. So program specific requirements is different subject by subject. Once again, we will need to look at the program you're submitting an application to. And here are some examples. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. It's not complete. Um, it doesn't have all the program requirements, but it gives you a sense of usually what they will be. So in some of the program, like in the case of, say, architectural studies, it will say you have to have a satisfactory performance in an aptitude exercise that the faculty gives out um, after the deadline of application. You might find other programs that will say they have a preference for fluency in Chinese uh, in the case of speech and hearing science because they are in essentially uh, a program that works with people on Chinese speech patterns. So you will find different nuances that can help guide you to determine whether you have the right profile for your application. You will also see some programs that have very specific subject requirements, like engineering, they always require mathematics and physics. Um, different qualifications will have different levels of requirements. So in the IB terms, they will need mathematics at a higher level, physics at a higher level. But on the A level, it's required that you have mathematics at the A level, for example. So you should refer again to the website for information that can guide you on how to assess this. Um, you also have programs like in the case of Bachelors of Laws and Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery that will require applicants to have good uh, to have them as a first choice. So this we will come to come back to this in terms of program choices later on in the session. But what you can imagine is these are very competitive programs and they want students to be very firm in saying that I am definitely interested in this program. I would like to this is my first choice, this is how is actually the program I'd like to enter at HKU. And so you can work with them on that one and that will be a guide for you as well on how to prepare your application accordingly. The other requirements that you also have to meet are the English language requirement and the second language requirement. So in the English language requirement, it refers to demonstrating a proficiency in a language other than, uh, sorry, in a language, in the English language. So it could be done either via your IB English exams, it could be done your IGCSE English, uh, it can be met with your SAT reasoning, it can be done via an IELTS or TOEFL exam. There are different ways to meet this requirement. Again, it's on our website. Uh, you can refer to it carefully and check whether you hold the right qualification. The other requirement is a second language requirement. And that one refers to a proficiency in a language other than English. Um, it does not have to be Chinese. It can actually be any language that is not English. So we've had students apply to us with Spanish. We've had students apply with Latin, actually. We've had students apply with French. Um, it is up to you. So you might already have a native language that is not English. Um, as long as you can provide us with a demonstrated proficiency in that language, you can be deemed to have met this requirement. So you can actually remember you have to fulfill this, but it does not have to be Chinese. Moving on to the actual application side of things. So uh, for those of you who are looking for admissions, in the September 2020 intake, you would note that the application has already opened and the deadline for application actually is November 22nd at noon. So you should be planning your application, you should be budgeting your time accordingly. The application itself will allow you to stay on and complete for as long as you need to complete the application, uh, as long as you have to keep in mind the deadline of having to submit it by noon of November 22nd. 
If you have to submit a late application, the system will still be open until July 15th of 2020. However, if you've submitted beyond the main round deadline, your application will only be looked at if there is availability in your chosen program. So you do have to consider your sort of um, timing accordingly. You should have considering whether or not it's a right fit for you, whether or not you, you, you should, you will be able to make the deadline. Keep in mind also that is the university will also carry admissions interviews and a lot of these interviews do happen in December and January. So if you miss the deadline, it is unlikely we will be able to shortlist you in time for these admissions interview and these will actually, um, these are actually additional factors we can check in to consider your application to the university as well. We aim to start issuing offers um, starting in January 2020 and onward. Usually when we issue offers, we will have looked at your results. We would have looked at whether or not you're a good fit to the university and decide if we will have the offers out to you. Um, the offers usually have a three, two to three week validity period, meaning you have to decide on the offer within, upon receiving the offer and return to the university whether or not you will accept the offer within a stated period of time. You will also have to put down your admissions deposit at the time of accepting an offer. So this might come into play in terms of your timeline as well on your application to the university. So on the application itself, there are actually five program choices on the application. You have to state one first choice and you will be asked to state four other choices that is not that are not ranked. Um, this goes back to earlier when I was saying, remember when you're looking at the program specific requirement, you actually have programs that will require a first choice. So in that sense, you will want to make sure your first choice program if you have one, are the ones that have a strong preference for first choice candidate. That is your way of knowing whether or not you have good chance and good standing to the eva for your evaluation into the university. All the programs will evaluate candidates at the same time. So unless a program has stated they have a preference for first choice candidate, all the other programs will evaluate everyone at the same time. And therefore you might be given actually what we call multiple offers. A multiple offer case is when you actually receive more than one offer to the University of Hong Kong in the same academic year. You do not have to choose right away. Um, you will have up until the release of your final results to decide whether or not you will pick up one offer or the other. And you only have to put down one admissions deposit in order to retain multiple offers to the university. However, you might be getting conditional offers um, from us if your final results are not released. So that's another way for you to actually budget your time. You actually have time to plan out your study plan, you have time to chart out what it is that you'd like to see for yourself at the university, even after you've received an offer, if you have applied to more than one program. Moving along further on your app, on how you prepare, um, the first thing you want to make sure you have ready at is actually your academic history. Uh, we refer here on academic results, but we also ask for your academic history so that we can understand what you've gone through as an applicant, where you've come from, what have you studied before. So all of these information will be helpful because we want to see where you were from and have good assessment of you as an applicant overall. Um, the university will also work with what we call predicted results. So for some of you, your exam results for your final exam may not be available until perhaps March, May, or even August uh, of 2020. Um, it, does, it should not deter you from applying if your, if your goal is to be admitted and to study at HKU in September 2020. You should still look at the timeline and deadline of November 22nd very seriously because the university is able to work with you on predicted results. The key for you here is to speak to your counselors, make sure your school is aware that we are actually giving, a, uh, providing us sort of your prediction so that we can work on that and issue conditional offers if we have to. After you've submitted the application to the university, you will have a chance to upload your documents. 
uh, among the documents you have to upload, there will be a requirement for a personal statement. You will only get one personal statement, regardless of how many program choices you've made. So you might have very, you might have filled out all five program choices on the application and they might be wildly different from one another. Even if that, you will only get one personal statement and that statement will be read by all your programs. So you will have to be quite careful in how you choose your program choices and also how you write your personal statement so that it actually reflects on who you are, um, your study style, your study plan, your objectives, your goals, who you are as a person and how you fit in with the study environment at the program you've chosen. Your statement can be uploaded after you've submitted the application, so there's no need to panic if you don't see it before you submit. It actually comes after you've submitted the application. And lastly, and one of the things we always get asked as well is, uh, what happens if there is an update on your academic information? Actually, the university's um, non jupas application system does allow you to update your academic profile even after you've submitted the application. So on your academic qualifications, if there is any update or by the time your final results are released and you need to make sure the university receives the most updated information, you can actually do that and submit the final results to us via the online system. We will actually carry out our evaluation. So I mentioned earlier, we start issuing offers in January 2020, uh, but we will continue to evaluate applications beyond that point. And if there are updated informations on your files, we will use the updated academic results to evaluate your application again. Um, other things to note on your application. So, um, as you are preparing your applications, you might be gathering your personal identification record, you might have your school transcripts, you might have the transcripts and report cards from your previous studies. You can prepare all of that in one go and upload a scanned copy onto the system. At the time of evaluation, we are really looking at scanned copy and that would be sufficient. If we need any hard copy or official documents, we will reach out to you. Usually, we will only reach out for these documents at, after you've confirmed your offer. So after your final results are released is usually when we ask for these official documents. So don't panic and don't need to rush to send us any documents before we've asked for it. Um, we will let you know what documents are needed uh, for you to actually look uh, to actually send them to us. Also, the other thing many students do forget sometimes is to make sure that your contact information with the university is up to date. Um, oftentimes, we communicate with students via email. Um, that will include any update to your application. Uh, it will also include if you are invited to an interview. It will include whether or not you've been um, issued an offer of admission. All of that will come through the email. So please make sure you're checking the email and you're actually, you are the one as an applicant looking at the email that you've given to the university because we will need to be communicating with you directly, specifically on your application. Um, sometimes the emails might end up in the spam folder. Please do check that. And also for this year onward, a lot of our communications with you will be logged on the application system. So you can always refer back to the application system for updates if you have any sort of questions about whether there are any updates on your application to the university, you can log back onto the system to have a look. Okay, so this um, is sort of an overview of what most of the time, most of the students will ask us in terms of questions on applying to the university.